What has been cut away here? The rest of the body and then the ramus. Yeah? So how do you imagine that this nerve is passing? You see it in the bone right there? Yeah. How did it get in there? Through the mandibular foramen. It sure did. It got in there through the mandibular foramen. Now this picture doesn't show it, but what's the name of that hole? Mental foramen. That's the mental foramen. It's going to come out here and supply sensory stuff on the front of my chin. So it supplies the lower teeth and the skin of the jaw and the lower jaw for sensory information. Mandibular branch of five. Okay, here's the spinosum. It has one little vessel that passes through it, the middle meningeal artery. Okay, and there are the holes again. So locate them for me. All right, the ethmoid bone is next on the skull. We're getting close to finishing the skull. This one has several pieces and parts and several viewpoints. Okay, so I like to teach it. To, I like to start with the ethmoid and the sagittal view here. Um, there is one piece of the sphenoid that I didn't mention to you. I apologize. Um, I never miss it, so I didn't have it underlined, but I missed it. It just dawned on me. Um, so we'll do the sinuses here in just a second uh, when I finish with the ethmoid. But this one I wanted to, this one I, I forgot to mention to you, that little saddle-like structure of the sphenoid. Did y'all learn its name it's in the lab? That's the cella tersica. Sometimes it's referred to as Turk's saddle. That's its eponym, but we call it the cella tersica. And the pituitary gland sits there. Now, make a mental note here. It should not be trivialized just to say to a table. Because that little gland that sits right there is attached to the base of your brain. And I would defy you to find me a hormone system in the human body that is not either directly or indirectly impacted by that gland. <coughs> the pituitary gland. Together with the part of the brain that it's attached to, they serve as the master hormone control center of humanity. The hypothalamic control of the pituitary and all of the myriad of hormones that they produce, which you'll learn next semester, really controls hormones in the human body. Now, think about the location of this for just a moment. <clears throat> This is right in the center here. But if I work my way, if I came on the lesser wing toward you, uh, like this right here, the first opening in that lesser wing would be the optic canal. Right here. So, cellulitis go right here, optic canal right here. That's why I'm telling you this. When the optic nerve comes from your eyes through that canal, Right where the connection of the brain to the pituitary is, actually right in front of it, the optic nerves cross. This is a nervous system phenomenon. Everybody who's on the right likes to go left, and everybody who's on the left likes to go right. You saw this already in the medulla with the crossing of the somatic motor fibers, and it's just going to keep coming up. Individuals who have pituitary problems, things that are going to mess with them hormonally because they have some kind of growth in the pituitary hormone, like cancerous growth or even benign, will oftentimes first notice problems in vision. And that's an anatomy thing that describes that because the visual information is right next to the pituitary gland. So any kind of bulge or anything. Now, think about this. If you had to go in surgically and get to it, how would you get there? So it's bone all around it. The shortest distance would be from the orbit. Nobody's going to do that. Nobody's drilling through the back of your eye to get to the pituitary. You've got a whole new set of problems now. What about from the top? Can you get to it from the top? Nobody's going through the whole brain to get there. What about from the side? Again, nobody's going through the whole brain to get there. So what option do we have left? I see everybody going low. That's right. So normally they go up through the top of the maxilla this way. Up behind the nasal canal. 
up behind the nasal cavity this way. They drill up through the top of the jawbone like this to go uh, under the nasal cavity to get to the pituitary. It's a horrific procedure. I had a, a, a girl in my class three years ago. Um, she's finished here now, but she had a pituitary tumor. We had a faculty member here a few years ago who had a pituitary tumor. You know her. And the issue with secretion of some hormones made a mess of things. So um, this is a very important spot. I didn't want to rush over it, the cellotercin bone. All right, now to the ethmoid. The ethmoid bone here can be seen from several different views. And I like to start with this one because it shows you um, the orientation of the stomach. <coughs> you guys know already the ethmoids in the eye, don't you? Nasal, maxilla, lacrimal, ethmoid. That's anterior, posterior on the medial wall of the orbit. So it's part of the medial wall of the orbit, no doubt. But this guy right here is also part of your nose. The ethmoid makes up part of the bony nasal septum. I mentioned it to you on the first skull slot because I told you about the vomer. And I said the vomer and part of the ethmoid. And I said we're going to look at this again. You're going to see this bony nasal septum. It's made up of two bones. The perpendicular plate of the ethmoid and the vomer together make the bony support in the middle of your nose. Now, if you work your way into the cranial vault, the ethmoid actually protrudes all the way up into your skull, all the way up into the cavity where your brain is, and there's a piece of it that extends up on the anterior side, right between the two anterior cranial fossa, called the cristigali. That is the anterior anchor for the brain meninges. If you are removing a skull from uh, if you're removing a brain from a skull in a gross anatomy lab, they take a saw and the technician, they don't let the kids do it, they bring the technician in, a Dremel saw, and they drill right around here, and then they remove the cap of the brain. And then the students have to dissect the brain to remove it. So they have to be very careful with the meninges because there's a fused layer of meninges on the top. And normally, if they asked me, um, I would do it this way. We did, um, we watched them do this a couple of years ago. Um, they, they normally start this dissection from the back, so from the bottom of the brain. So they work, they work, they wear, they work their, their way around on the base of the brain, cutting the cranial nerve attachments and the spinal cord. And then they lift the brain out from the back forward. The last thing you cut before the brain comes out is the attachment of the meninges to the cristigallo. And then you're done. That's the last thing you do. It is an important anchor point. The skull, the brain, y'all, does not attach directly to the bones. The outer layer of meninge is fused, and then between that fused layer and the layer that actually is in contact with the brain, there's a gap there. So you'll learn all these gaps later with the meninges. The brain is floating because there's fluid in that gap. And so the brain moves around the skull. And so when you jostle your head, your brain actually moves. And so if you smash your head into something like a soccer ball, it will actually smash the brain into the skull bone and cause concussions and problems. Right. Um, so this is... This is the anterior attachment of the meninges, the cristigali. Now, on either side of that cristigali, there's a plate called cribriform. the cribriform plate. And in that plate, there are holes called cribriform. olfactory foramina. Right? What nerve sends its information through the olfactory foramina? Olfactory. And which one is that? One. Right. So. That is the cribriform plate, the cristigali, and the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid and the ethmoid in the... So here it is, the cribriform plate. Don't misspell that. It's got an R in it. Um, I always want to say cribriform. It's cribriform plate of the ethmoid where the olfactory frame would pass through. Okay, now... Good. Okay, so at this point in time, um, I've done what I'm going to do with the head. Y'all happy? Certainly, 
there's a gazillion more things to learn. But I feel like at this point, you've got, you've got what you need from me because I can put the major muscle groups on. I got muscles on the face. I can chew. I can innervate them. I know the basics of things that pass through to get to them. I can basically describe now a nerve going to a muscle to the head. It's on the head. And I've already tipped you off on a couple of them in the neck. But as you saw on that neck picture, there's a lot of C1, C3, ANSI cervicalis, all this crazy terminology that you don't know yet. Okay, so I need to introduce you to the basic principles of spinal nerves. I'm done right now with the basic principles of cranial nerves, but I need to teach you the basic principles of spinal nerves. And you know some of this already. For example, if you had a spinal cord and you went out the dorsal side, what kind of information would you be watching? Sensory. And if you went out the ventral side, what kind of information would you be watching? Motor. Motor. Okay. If you went out the dorsal side, on the roots that are attached on the dorsal side of the cord, you would run into a cluster of cell bodies pretty quickly. I would call those the dorsal root ganglia. You were introduced to it the first time I mentioned fibrocartilage, because I wanted you to know where the pain's coming from. It's coming from the dorsal root ganglia. Okay, so there are some things that you already know. Let me ask you this. If I went out the spinal nerve, you know, after the two roots meet, and now it's a nerve, would I find sensory and motor information in every one of those? Yeah. It's going both ways. We talked about that. If I was in the thoracic divisions of the spinal cord, what else would I see coming off that spinal nerve? Yeah, what would we call those? He said sympathetic. Sympathetic connections. Okay. There are post ganglionic there, but there's two connectors from the sympathetic ganglia to the nerve. The rami or the rami, I guess. The rami or the rami, communicantes. One of them would be white, and one of them would be green. Okay, so y'all remember all that. So let's let's go through it now and pick up the new stuff. All right. So the first thing says that each root has several rootlets. This is an anatomy phenomenon. People learn from a textbook that there's a ventral root and a dorsal root coming off the cord, and that is not what it looks like. You do a dissection, that's not what you see. Instead, it looks like hands of roots that come off into roots. Hands into roots. So it's, it's multiple rootlets off of spinal segments that form individual roots. So true, there are in fact 31 pairs of these that come off. But their contact with the cord is not an individual uh, one segment, one root contact. It looks like rootlets that form a single root from a single segment. So it's an important anatomy observation, rootlets. All of these spinal segments have both sensory and motor information. The dorsal and ventral roots are long at the cauda equina. All right? You don't know this yet. This is new. The cauda equina is the end of the spinal cord. When we are growing up as children, you'll remember it this way if I say it. This way. When we're growing up as kids, our vertebral column grows faster than our spinal cord does. So every human who finishes growth in puberty, whenever they finish their growth, has a spinal cord that's shorter than their vertebral column. In fact, your spinal cord ends at the second lumbar division. How many lumbar divisions are there? Five, and then below that we've got sacral and coccyx, right? Is there a hole in the sacrum for the spinal cord? Yeah. Is there spinal cord there? No, there's not. Okay, so what happens is, up at the top in the cervical regions, and you're working your way down to the thoracic regions, you see the rootlets coming off from the roots. But as you get closer to the lumbar regions, the roots that are coming off don't just come off and go straight out like this. The roots, as you get into the lumbar area, 
the end of the thoracic and lumbar area, the roots all turn downward. And so the, the lumbar nerves, L3, L4, and L5, which are really important, and the sacral nerves, down to the coccygeal nerves, that pass through the sacrum, all originate from the spinal cord at L2 or higher. And so the roots are confusing there, right? You think of a root as a little piece that comes off the cord. There's the cord, and there's a little root, and a little root. But when you get low in the spinal cord, those roots have to chase down the cord and come out at the appropriate segment, which means the roots at the bottom get longer. And if you dissect the spinal cord out of the spinal canal, out of the vertebral canal, and you hold it up, the end of the spinal cord looks like a horse's tail because those roots have to be longer. And that's where it gets its name. Equina horse, cauda tail. The cauda equina are the long roots, the long dorsal and ventral roots below L2. Good? Okay, so the dorsal and ventral and meningeal rami. Okay, so this is extremely important. This is new. This is new. Each spinal cord segment is responsible for feeding a dorsal and a, a ventral. Y'all knew that. When they come together, they form a spinal nerve. Y'all knew that. You also knew that coming off that spinal nerve are communicating branches to the sympathetic chain ganglia in the thoracic divisions. Y'all knew that already. What you didn't know from me yet is that just as soon as it comes together to form a spinal nerve, it splits again into a dorsal, what's called a dorsal rami, and a ventral rami, and then a little tiny one that we'll spend no time talking about, this is it for me, a meningeal branch that turns and goes right back into the cord. These are the ones we're going to talk about, the dorsal and the ventral rami. Now, the, we did this. The dorsal rami follow a segmental pattern. That is, you can work the dorsal rami to the deep structures of the back. Please hear me. If you get it now, y'all, it'll make this life so much easier as you go. This is just fundamentals. The dorsal rami that come off feed the muscle groups in a segmental pattern, which means they are very predictable. If you know which spinal cord segment you're on, you touch the muscle there, you can guess where the information came from. Now, these dorsal rami are responsible primarily for the deep muscles of the back. <coughs> we call them the erector spinae. These are the muscles we don't think about contracting. They're keeping you erect. The deep muscles of the back. And I'll name them for you. I'll give you deep general names for them. And that's really the only place we're going to emphasize the dorsal rami. All of the complicated anatomy is on the ventral side. The ventral rami of these guys, the ventral rami of the spinal cord, form the plexuses. The ventral rami of the spinal nerves form the plexuses. Where are the plexuses? Up here and down here. What are they responsible for? Limb movement. Upper extremities, lower extremities. These are the ventral rami. Okay, so finish class by labeling them for me. Ready? Name in the spinal cord. Okay, start with another one. Name in the spinal cord. Ventral horn. Lateral, Lateral funiculus. 
anterior funiculus. Dorsal. Root. Dorsal root ganglia. Ventral root. Spinal nerve. Rami communicantes. Sympathetic ganglia. Rami communicantes. What's this branch? Meningeal. Ventral. Ramus. Dorsal ramus. The ventral rami will feed cervical, brachial, lumbar, and sacral plexus. This is where we're going to spend our whole lives for the next few class periods. Cervical, brachial, lumbar, and sacral plexus. Innervating the muscles of the human body. Okay. We'll pick up on Monday.